Good day, everyone. This is the second joint webinar session between the IECN CEM Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group webinar series, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice, and the ongoing Pulse the Planet series led by NatureServe and supported by GeoBond and EcoHealth Alliance. My name is Brock Blevins. I am co-lead for the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, and I am joined by Karen Nelson, the lead of the group, as well as Miguel Fernandez, Director of the Latin American and Caribbean Programs from NatureServe. The NatureServe network is made up of 87 member organizations from Patagonia to Alaska, and they're working on different projects, including climate change, invasive species, ecosystem services, citizen science, and land degradation and restoration. If you're based in the Latin American and Caribbean region, being a member to the network does not cost anything. The network is open and the main objective is to facilitate and manage regional projects that have to do with global change. The Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group is a group within the Commission on Ecosystem Management of the IUCN and membership to the Commission is also of no cost. The Commission members are a volunteer network serving scientific expertise to IUCN-led initiatives. Both of our webinar series convene monthly, and once a quarter we combine participation for special global topics in restoration, as we have here today, from Bethany Walder, Executive Director for the Society of Ecological Restoration. Now I'll pass this off to Karen Nelson, who will introduce Bethany. Hello, everyone. I am extremely pleased to welcome Bethany Walder as our webinar speaker today. Bethany is the Executive Director of the Society for Ecological Restoration, also called SIR, which is an organization that is known for advancing the science behind the practice of ecological restoration and that has members in 80 countries around the globe. The Commission on Ecosystem Management of IUCN and SCR have a long history of collaboration on technical guidance for ecological restoration. And I'm really pleased that Bethany could join us today supporting our webinar. Bethany joined the society in 2015, and since joining has been instrumental in assisting the society and also really the global restoration community with innovating emerging scientific ideas into practice. As part of this work, she's been one of the leaders in the production of the society's standards for ecological restoration, which is the subject of her talk today. But prior to joining SER, Bethany worked extensively in the United States and primarily in the Western United States on the policy, science, and practice of forest restoration primarily on public lands. She has an interdisciplinary background she received her undergraduate degree in political science and international studies from Duke University. And then her, she did her master's work in environmental studies in the Western United States at University of Montana, which is in Missoula, and also happens to be the institution that I work at. So I've had the great pleasure both of working with Bethany and also sharing the community in which we live and can attest to how inspirational she's been both within our community and for the restoration community overall. Thanks to all of you who are listening and especially for taking time to listen on the summer or winter solstice, depending on where you live, because um, it's a fun day to celebrate and be out in nature. So thanks for sitting behind your computer. I'm just going to start by telling folks a little bit about the Society for Ecological Restoration. I'll keep that super fast. Um, our mission is to advance the science, practice, and policy of ecological restoration to sustain biodiversity, improve resilience in a changing climate, and reestablish an ecologically healthy relationship between nature and culture. We run a series of programs, and as Kara said, we have members across the world. We have chapters and we're fairly well known for our biennial world conferences on ecological restoration. Our eighth world conference is coming up in Cape Town, South Africa in September and the 
early bird registration ends June 30th. So if you haven't registered yet, I strongly encourage you to do so and to come learn more about restoration in South Africa. We do a lot of work related to international policy and the discussion today is really focused on that and on our standards for international, the international standards for the practice of ecological restoration. But we also have a series of other publications, including the journal Restoration Ecology and Island Press SER joint book series with more than with 28 titles to date and other reports and policy papers and things like that. I also want to point out that SER hosts what we call the Restoration Resource Center, which you can access from our website. And it's a wiki style, openly accessible database with nearly 2,000 resources related to restoration and a projects database with about 300 projects in it. We strongly encourage you to submit your projects and resources to the database um, and to share your restoration successes and challenges with others working in this field. So I'm gonna talk today about the challenges facing restoration as it's mainstreamed, especially when we look at um, the intersection of ecosystem services and biodiversity. A solution that we propose through the implementation of SER standards, and then how we get from theory to practice. So when we talk about this challenge, I think one of the things we want to start with is why are we talking about restoration? And when we see headlines that, like those that came out after the IPBES global assessment, with things like UN report says Earth faces unprecedented threat to biodiversity, or report one million animal and plant species face extinction risk, um, it really causes a lot of stress and challenge for people. But we're also seeing headlines like as the world burns, the case for restoration imperative and regreening the earth, protecting the climate through ecosystem restoration. So we're starting to illustrate that conservation alone is not enough and restoration really has become imperative to our survival as a species. I want to spend a few minutes looking at some definitions of restoration and um, please note the initials because they're going to come back in just a minute. Um, SER defines ecological restoration as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. We define restorative activities as those activities, including restoration, that reduce degradation, that redu including ecological restoration, that reduce degradation or improve conditions for the partial or full recovery of ecosystems. And forest and landscape restoration is defined as the process of regaining ecological functionality and enhancing human well being across deforested or degraded forest landscapes. I think most of you on this call know these other definitions like degradation, conservation, ecosystem services, and biodiversity. I want to specifically call out land degradation neutrality as a state whereby the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and enhance food, secur food security remains stable or increases within specified temporal and spatial scales and ecosystems. So the reason these are initials are here is because we've been trying to really define restoration and its role in um, the global landscape. So if we think about the current environmental status across the world, with C being conservation and ER being ecological restoration and D being degradation, even with conservation and restoration combined, it's less than, the, the benefits of that are less than degradation. And you can see that when you look at the increase in ecological, in ecosystem services from conservation plus restoration as well as the increase in biodiversity from conservation plus restoration is still less than the decrease in ecosystem services and biodiversity from degradation. And many of the initiatives that are being implemented right now are looking at a short-term goal of land degradation neutrality. So how do we get to 
even? How do we get to a place where conservation plus ecological restoration equals degradation? And in so doing, then the increase in ecosystem services and biodiversity from conservation and restoration would be less than or equal to the decrease in ecosystem services and biodiversity from degradation. So that's really the challenge that we're facing at this point in time. But just getting to neutrality is not enough. And so for SER, the long-term goal is really getting to net improvement in ecological condition which means that conservation plus ecological restoration will increase both ecosystem services and biodiversity. And that increase will be greater than the decrease from continued degradation. The challenge, however, even in the short-term goal with land degradation neutrality, is that climate change may increase the impacts of degradation while reducing the effectiveness of restoration. So if we focus on a single ecosystem service, uh, um, so, so we have that challenge that has to be added into this equation. The other challenge is that if we focus on a single ecosystem service, that may result in increasing that ecosystem service while reducing biodiversity and other ecosystem functions. So even here in the short-term goal with conservation plus ecological restoration equaling degradation, we know that there are a number of projects being implemented where biodiversity is actually going down as a result of the projects not going up. And so even if we combine those together and they equal um, the level of degradation, we may not be improving biodiversity. So this balance of biodiversity and ecosystem services is really one of the challenges we need to face in the global landscape. So there are a variety of global initiatives and targets that um, we are, that many of you on this call already know about. And um, those include the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN, the recently announced UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, um, and these other things listed here. I'm going to speed through this a little bit because I think you know about this stuff and we're running a little behind. But I'm going to walk through some of these initiatives and then the targets that are included in them. The first one we discussed earlier, um, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the global assessment was just released, calling for transformative changes to restore and protect nature. And one of the points in that release is that more than half a million species, terrestrial species, will not have enough habitat for long-term survival without habitat restoration. So making the direct link between restoration and um, planetary survival. The sustainable development goals, I think all of you are familiar with these, and most people regularly refer to goals 13, 14, and 15, climate action, life below water, and life on land, as the key goals that um, are affected by restoration. But we were really pleased when the new UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was released on, or announced on March 1st, 2019, in that um, in the announcement, they pointed to the nine of the 17 Sustainable De Development Goals as benefiting from restoration programs. And um, how restoration can basically help remove um, 13 to 26 more gigatons of greenhouse gases and generate $9 trillion in ecosystem services. The press release for the UN Decade defines ecosystem restoration as opposed to ecological restoration, and it does it twice. So in the bold letters, it defines it as basically improving the productivity and capacity of ecosystems to meet the needs of society. So again, when we look at that balance between ecosystem services and biodiversity, if we use this definition of restoration, we have to understand how are we going to incorporate biodiversity into those ecosystem services because biodiversity doesn't always in and of itself meet the needs of society. So this is really one of the challenges that we're facing. In addition to these global initiatives, there are a series of global targets like the IE chart, the IE chart targets from the CBD, which call for the restoration of at least 15% of degraded lands from all the partner countries, um, noting, of course, that the United States is not a party to the um, convention. But this is really driving a lot of restoration around the globe. 
Um, and the bond challenge is one of the big initiatives really driving restoration around the globe, calling for um, initially 150 million hectares of deforested and degraded land to be restored by 2020 and 350 million hectares to be restored by 2030 as the challenge was amended by the New York Declaration on Forests. To date, they've, they've received 150, 70 million hectares of commitments from countries around the world. And regional initiatives include things like the um, initiative 20 by 20 in South America calling for 20 million hectares to be restored by 2020 and the AFR 100 in Africa calling for 100 million hectares to be restored by 2030 and there's for example 113 million hectares committed by the countries pictured here in red. So these aggressive targets really result in aggressive action on restoration but targets don't equal standards. And so this aggressive action is great. And the fact that people are talking about and starting to implement and making commitments to restoration is a really, really wonderful thing. But implementation of these projects is inconsistent and there are no commonly accepted standards for restoration. SER believes that by adopting and implementing international standards, we can create a basis upon which to measure project and program effectiveness. But we also have to recognize that projects that focus on a sole ecosystem service, especially projects that focus solely on carbon sequestration, are not necessarily ecological or even ecosystem restoration projects. We have many projects, for example, that are being implemented to um, sequester carbon and that are driving afforestation. And in these situations, native ecosystems, for example, intact savannas, may be plowed up and destroyed in the name of planting a monoculture of non-native species to gain carbon credits. And so that could result in an increase in that ecosystem service of carbon credits and a decrease in biodiversity and native um, ecosystem presence on the planet. So we need to really understand how to implement restoration and, and bundle, bio, bundle ecosystem services together so that we have a full suite of services that are, being that are being delivered from the interventions that are implemented. So an integrated approach to ecological and ecosystem restoration goals can help deliver both biodiversity and ecosystem outcomes. Ecological restoration is the intervention and the action, and biodiversity and ecosystem services are the outcomes. So just to put this in real terms, let's take a quick look at the Grain for Green program in China as a case study. So this program was started in 1999 to deliver two specific ecosystem services, flood control and erosion control. And a number of additional benefits were also um, identified. It is the largest or one of the largest reforestation programs in the world. And in 14 years in China, they were able to reestablish 28 million hectares of forest. So when we think about scaling up restoration and we get paralyzed, how are we going to do all of this? How are we going to do 350 million hectares in 12 more years? In China, they were able to actually reforest 30 million hectares in 14 years, and the program is still going on. But the majority of those projects are monocultures, 82%. And assessments, including this one by um, Hua et al., found that the projects, the, the, rest, the monocultures, and the majority of these um, efforts, or at least the tested sample sites, are resulting in significant loss of biodiversity for bees, birds, and insects. They actually found that the adjacent agricultural areas had higher biodiversity than the replanted forests. So this project achieved its objectives. It's improving flood control and it's improving erosion control. However, it is degrading biodiversity in the process. So how do we implement projects like this in a way that is more holistic. One way is to use multi-species restoration efforts and to focus not just on making sure there's vegetation in the form of trees on these areas, but actually a, a forest, a living healthy forest with healthy um, soils, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit about the solution now and about the standards. So there 
are a variety of standards and guidelines out there in the uh, ecosystem, let's say, in the global ecosystem. Those include, for example, um, a product that IUCN and Parks Canada and SER partnered on together in 2012 to develop ecological restoration for protected areas. The CBD has 12 principles for the ecosystem approach. Red Plus has social environmental standards. The forest and landscape restoration has a series of six principles. And SER has its international standards for the practice of ecological restoration. The standards were initially introduced at the CBD COP13 in Cancun, Mexico in December 2016. They're built on a variety of SER foundation documents, including our 2004 primer, as well as the 2012 IUCN Parks Canada SER um, document on protected areas, and most recently SER's Australia 2016 national standards. There's also a variety of other documents over time that were built into these standards. In the first um, edition, we went through a series of external reviews and we designed the standards to be a living document with regular review and revision. Um, almost immediately after launching the standards, we began uh, a review process that's been a review process, uh, two years of internal and external review, including listening sessions, web surveys, knowledge cafes, um, and even published critiques and responses in the peer-reviewed literature. Those resulted in four key topics that needed to be improved in version two. First, strengthening the discussion of cultural social elements, including traditional cultural ecosystems. Clarifying and expanding the text related to restoration targets so readers better understand the need to allow for temporal change. Improving the restorative continuum with respect to the ecosystem landscape nexus and considering provenance issues for seed and other propagules. Um, we're going to discuss a bunch of those things in a few minutes. So the international standards are applicable across all types of ecosystems. They are also applicable across all sectors. In section one, we introduce um, basically what ecological restoration is and that combination of conserving biodiversity and human well being. How do we really start to use standards to deliver both of those things as outcomes from restoration? We articulate the need for principles and standards. We explain our approach to these standards. In version two, we talk about what's new in this version. And this presentation today is the first um, presentation with most of these new materials. So I'm very excited to be able to share these with you. We also talk about the underpinning assumptions to restoration, and we include some key definitions and terms in section one. The key updates in section two include that um, the principles are reorganized to highlight social, economic, and cultural components, and, and we've introduced a new social benefits wheel. We have um, combined the principles and key concepts into a single set of eight principles, and we talk quite a bit about scaling up and the relationship between restoration and allied activities. And then we've um, included a new section four on leading practices that addresses reference models, restoration approaches, seed sourcing, and integrating restoration into global restoration initiatives. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time walking through the eight principles because the bulk of the standards um, of how the standards really influence the global restoration initiatives is contained in these eight principles. We'll walk through them one by one. So principle one is that ecological restoration engages stakeholders. And in principle one, number one, the stakeholder issue was one of the biggest critiques we received and the, the social, cultural, sociocultural components. So we've um, extensively added to, the, to the, the standards on that topic. And we've also developed what we're calling the social benefits wheel to as a companion to the ecological recovery wheel, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So the social benefits wheel includes six wedges with topics such as community well-being, stakeholder engagement, benefits distribution, knowledge enrichment, restoring natural capital, and sustainable economies. And the idea is that as we implement restoration projects, we can assess both the social benefits and the ecological recovery. 
Principle two looks at the fact that ecological restoration draws on many types of knowledge, practitioner knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, local ecological knowledge, and scientific discovery. Principle three really starts to focus on what we call the reference ecosystem, which is a native ecosystem that is able to act as a model for ecological restoration. And we look at the fact that ecological restoration practice is informed by native reference ecosystems while considering environmental change. Again, remembering that one of the critiques in, um, in the first, for the first principles was that certain the first standards, I apologize, was that certain um, uh, reviewers thought that SCR's definition of restoration, assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, was about going back to a past ecosystem. SCR doesn't see it that way, but we spent a lot of time really re-articulating that and what the reference ecosystem is to show that our view of restoration does incorporate climate change and environmental change in general. We also developed a simple decision tree um, to help people articulate and, and define their, rest, re, their reference ecosystem. So are current conditions still broadly suitable for the existing or immediately prior ecosystem? If not, you go down. If yes, you can use that ecosystem as your reference ecosystem, and et cetera, et cetera. Principle four looks at the fact that ecological res restoration supports and optimizes ecosystem recovery processes. And what we mean by this is that the restoration interventions should be designed to assist natural processes. Everything shouldn't be done by people, but we should be working with and partnering with nature and helping ecosystems get back to a capacity for self-organization and ecosystem resilience to future stresses. Principle five will come back to a couple of times, and that is that ecological restoration seeks the highest level of recovery possible. Looking at everything from full recovery, partial recovery, and recovery insofar as possible, we've basically, in the first round of the standards, introduced a five-star scale to enable people to measure where they are at those different levels of partial to full recovery. And then we developed and introduced the ecological recovery wheel to enable you to visually illustrate that for your partners, for your funders, and for yourself in terms of measuring, of designing, implementing, and measuring your restoration project. So the recovery wheel has six wedges, species composition, structural diversity, ecosystem function, external exchanges, absence of threats, and physical conditions. And within each of those wedges, there are a series of spokes that get into more detail. But generally speaking, the recovery wheel can be applied to any ecosystem anywhere. And it has been applied. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but this gives you an example of a hypothetical case study of a project that's aiming for four-star recovery. So in the baseline condition, we can see that some things are at one star, some are at two, some are at three. Um, and then in the hypothetical 10 years post-recovery, the majority have achieved four stars and a couple are still at three. You might even have one or two that achieve five-star recovery, but this project was aimed at four-star recovery. Principle six is about ecosystem, that ecosystem recovery is assessed against clear goals and objectives using measurable indicators. And this is where we really see um, also the recovery wheel starting to shine. You can see here a project from New South Wales in Australia where we have a before and a 10 years after recovery wheel. Now, obviously the recovery wheel's only been out for two years, but what we can see is they went in, they put in their baseline data to the recovery wheel, and you can see what the recovery wheel looks like at baseline and what it looks like after 10 years. And basically this project has achieved four-star recovery and it may continue moving on from there. One of the other things that people are doing with the recovery wheel is calibrating it for specific ecosystems. So in England, a master's student took the recovery wheel and he made amendments to the individual spokes specifically for river restoration. And then he went out and he did an assessment looking at 
And so this is about indicators. So he created indicators very specific to apply to the recovery wheel and then went out and did an assessment on seven completed restoration projects. And I think what's really exciting about the recovery wheel and the use of these indicators is that it illustrates that restoration does not always improve every condition that you're trying to improve. So he um, used a dashboarding approach with green, yellow, and red, showing which things improved, which things stayed the same, and which things actually degraded. And I think that that's a really important message for us to remember in terms of restoration. It's also going to be really exciting for us to be able to create those indicators for the social benefits wheel and to be able to look at that balance between ecosystem services and biodiversity and ecology and understand as we design and implement projects using the social and ecological wheels, are we seeing benefits only on the social side and not on the ecological side? Are we seeing benefits only on the ecological side and not on the social side? We'll really be able to start to assess how restoration interventions are achieving or not achieving different um, intended outcomes. We've also seen the recovery wheel calibrated for use in marine ecosystems. This is by the MRSA's group in Europe, which is working on marine ecosystem restoration and ecosystem services. We've also seen a, um, the Mexican, a group in Mexico, which has adapted the recovery wheel for use for coral reef ecosystems. So it's very exciting to see the recovery wheel being used in real time on the ground and helping people articulate the effectiveness design and uh, articulate the effectiveness of their restoration interventions. So not only is it a good tool for designing projects, but it's an excellent tool for communicating with the public and the media about effectiveness. Principle seven articulates that ecological restoration gains cumulative value when applied at large scales. And those, we need to think about things like gene flow, like species that need minimum habitat areas that are very large, um, the increasing scale of carbon sequestration, and what is the scale at which we need to implement restoration, and, and it is clearly at hundreds, thousands, and millions or hundreds of millions of hectares. And finally, in principle eight, we have updated and amended the restorative continuum. So we define that restoration is part of a continuum of restorative activities, and that restorative activities reduce degradation or improve conditions for the partial or full recovery of ecosystems. So I'm really pleased to be able to share with you the new restorative continuum today. And this is what it looks like. And basically, it has six um, gradations of restoration, um, which start with reducing societal impacts and then move to improving ecosystem management, repairing ecosystem function, initiating in native recovery, partially recovering native ecosystems, and fully recovering native ecosystems. So we have underneath that the kind of family of restorative activities, which include reducing impacts, remediation, rehabilitation, and ecological restoration. And we've defined ecological restoration really starting at that fourth gradation of initiating native recovery. What's really important to us about this continuum is that wherever you are on the continuum, you are taking restorative action. And all of those actions at all of those different levels need to be taken. While the ecological benefits of full recovery might be greater, as illustrated in the continuum, than the ecological benefits of just improving ecosystem management, you can't initiate full recovery in the middle of a city. So we need to recognize that different interventions are appropriate and needed in different places. And the majority of restoration is really going to occur in the center of this continuum. There are only so many places where full recovery is viable. And there are so many places that are 100% urban and where almost no native recovery will occur. Um, but in general, you can um, improve natural conditions in the built environment, and you can improve ecological conditions in a way that still engages and interacts with humans in fully recovered native ecosystems. So we need to have both of those things in both places. 
So that's the end of the introduction to the principles. I'll move on to section three of the standards, which looks, which is the actual standards of practice for planning and implementation. There are four components to the standards of practice. Those are planning and design, implementation, monitoring, documentation, evaluation, and reporting, and post-implementation maintenance. I'm not going to go into any of the actual standards of practice. We made a number of updates to those, but in large part, they remain essentially the same. And you could look at what is available on um, version one from our website right now. Um, they're very helpful from the practitioner perspective in terms of how to actually do restoration projects in a way consistent with um, these eight principles. Section four looks at leading practices. This is a new section of the standards. And it goes into great detail on developing the reference model on um, uh, detail on identifying appropriate ecological restoration approaches, selection of seeds and other prop fuels for restoration, and the role of restoration in global initiatives. So in the section on developing the restoration, the reference model, and Karen Nelson was very involved in this, um, we identify a set of best practices, including utilizing a broad set of ecosystem attributes, recognizing complexity, incorporating change, and using multiple reference sites. Um, I also want to talk about some language in the standards that looks at uncoupling the reference ecosystem from the target. So the reference model should describe the native ecosystem as if full recovery were the target. But not all projects will aim for full recovery, and they shouldn't all aim for full recovery. Therefore, when a project aims for full recovery, the target will align with the reference model. But when a project is aiming only at partial recovery, the target and the reference model will diverge, and that's okay. So the, you still identify your reference model, um, use a reference ecosystem, but you might, because of partial recovery, um, you might not be able to reintroduce all native species, or you might include non-native surrogates because your targets are different. Um, the next section looks at identifying appropriate ecological restoration approaches, and we really look at three approaches, natural or spontaneous regeneration, assisted regeneration, and reconstruction, but generally recognizing that restoration interventions really need to partner with nature. In the a third section of part four, we look at selecting seeds and other propagules and how we consider genetic considerations and looking at climate change and what that means, means for seed and propagule sourcing. So we introduce a number of different tools and look at assisted migration as well. Um, here's an example of one of the tables. This is um, reprinted from a work from Kay Havens from 2015 looking at how you choose whether you need to be more conservative or less conservative in your seed sourcing. But this is based on the type of plant, not based on climate. And then a second um, graphic that we've included, which also comes from previous work, is provenancing strategies for revegetation in the context of climate change. And this was something that was really missing in the first standards, and we're really pleased to have been able to include this in version two. And then finally, coming back to what we talked about at the beginning of this talk today, is the role of ecological restoration in global initiatives. We know restoration is being scaled up, and it's a critical role to get to that net improvement that we need to get to to maintain life on this planet. So um, we discussed the actual technical definitions of landscape restoration and forest landscape restoration, how those intersect, and we look at the fact that for ecological restoration to be included in landscape restoration, the targets and goals have to meet human needs. So again, how do we balance those ecosystem services with the ecological services? When restoration is delivered at the landscape scale, when we can take an integrated approach that incorporates multiple types of restorative activities along the continuum, we are most likely to be successful. So we, Close out the standards with glossary uh, of um, significantly expanded glossary and two appendices, one that goes into great detail on the broad range of principles that have been previously articulated that underpin restoration and other allied activities. And then we have blank social and 
um, ecological recovery wheels. So very, very briefly, and to leave a few minutes for question, I just have two more slides about moving from theory to practice. So I want to share with you the timetable for version two. Um, they are finished and they have been submitted for peer review in restoration ecology as a standalone open access special issue of the journal, assuming that the peer review goes well and we can accommodate any revisions requested. Um, and once that text is finalized, um, they will be issued as that standalone open access issue, and we will also simultaneously publish the standards ourselves in a format similar to version one. And we intend to make a very short summary version with the recovery wheels and the, or the benefits wheel and the recovery wheel and the continuum and the decision tree and those other tools, the principles. Um, so a 10 page or less version that really summarizes all the key components of the standards. And we'll be releasing those at the Eighth World Conference on Ecological Restoration in Cape Town. I do want to call out um, all of the authors of the version two of the journal. We've added about 15 authors to the journal from all over the world. It's been an incredibly exciting process. And I especially want to thank George Gann and Tim McDonald for all of their work on the standards. What I am presenting today is the work of a very large group of people. Kara Nelson has been very involved in this as well as others probably on this call. And from an implementation perspective, our goal is to implement the standards from a, in a broad diversity of local, regional, with a broad diversity of local, regional, and global entities. We'd also like to engage with partners and stakeholders to develop companion document, documents looking at biome, regional, or industry-specific standards. We want to partner with people using the standards, like some of those um, recovery wheel examples that I gave you, to understand how the standards are working and to assess their effectiveness and to implement adaptive management and improve the standards. Version one of the standards was translated into six languages. Chinese is actually just about to be released. And we will be looking for people to assist us with the translation of version two into as many languages as possible. And we want to understand and partner with people to use the standards as a core component of an integrated approach to restoration that balances that looks at all of those things along the continuum from sustainable use to conservation to restoration and looks at the balancing of and using the standards to help balance ecosystem services and biodiversity outcomes. And finally, we will assess, monitor, and as needed, adapt the standards to improve their utility. They are still a living document. We will revise them again in the future. This is such a dynamic field, but hopefully it will be about five years before we um, open them up again. So you can find the current version at ser.org forward slash standards. You can also learn about membership in SER by going to ser.org. You can learn about our conference and you can learn about the Restoration Resource Center. So I encourage you to go and learn more about SER. And with that, I will um, thank all of you for participating. Thank you so much, Bethany, for your fantastic overview of the standards. Thank you, Bethany. Okay. The next question is uh, from Marina, who is asking about how the standards can potentially improve technology for restoration and specifically for activities in uh, mine degraded sites. So there's a question about how standards can improve technology for restoration and specifically for restoration in mining degraded sites. Um, that is a great question. Um, I'm sure all of you will have great questions, so I'll try not to say that to everybody. Um, we are actually in discussions right now to create a companion document to the standards, tiered from the standards specifically for restoration of mining sites. So um, I think that the the way we would look at the intersection of technology and restoration is kind of of coming back to the principle about restoration um, integrating with nature. So how do we use technology to accelerate um, res um, restorative capacity in nature? And I'll give an example from my experience, um, which is not exactly a technology answer, but I think it also kind of is. Um, I have spent a lot of time working on um, ecological restoration 
um, through removing unneeded roads from um, wildland ecosystems, so dirt roads. And one of the biggest things is to remove culverts, so taking out um, this thing that we've put into nature that doesn't function correctly. Um, and using the standards to understand um, how activities like that can accelerate um, the ability of an ecosystem to um, regain resilience. And a number of assessments on that work have found that that type of engineering approach to restoration may be accelerating restoration on a geologic time. So how do we intersect that with the standards and understand what interventions can we take technologically that help nature the most? And that's how I would think about using the standards. But I don't know that that's a really good answer to your question. And I think we'd be able to answer it better after we um, work with these partners to develop mining specific standards. And we hope to have those done by December 2020. So if that's something you're interested in, please send me an email and I'll let you know how that's progressing and whether um, there's opportunities to engage. Next question, Kara. The second question is about marine restoration and whether the standards provide any information on that. Great. The question is, um, do the standards provide any information on marine restoration? So the standards don't provide information on any specific ecosystem at this point in time. But they can be applied to any ecosystem. And we have seen groups starting to adapt them for marine ecosystems. We are also working with the Nature Conservancy, which is developing standards for marine and coral reef intersect in restoration, and we're meeting with them to crosswalk the SER standards with their standards so that um, there is consistency. But the standards themselves don't apply to any individual. So Kara, I'm gonna go to Miguel for a question now. Okay, so for the people on Zoom, the question is, is there a new definition of forest restoration in the standards in response to an article in Nature from 2019 that says that the best tool for restoring carbon or for um, sequestering carbon is um, with a different approach to forest restoration? So again, similar to the comment on marine restoration, the standards do not articulate restoration in any individual ecosystem. In section four of the standards, we do look at the current definition and principles of forest and landscape restoration, but because these are not forest specific standards, we don't give a definition of forest restoration itself. That is something that in that, you know, kind of implementation and next steps, is very interesting to us. Can we develop a companion document that looks just at forest restoration and how you would um, hone in on tropical, on dry, on temperate forest ecosystems and apply these standards to those ecosystems to improve the delivery of outcomes and hopefully of a full suite of benefits so that you don't end up with the type of situations that you have, for example, with the Green for Green program. So I think it's a really good question, but these standards, because they're generic, don't answer that question at this point in time. We would love to partner with somebody to answer that question. So the question for those on Zoom is, where can we find funding for restoration projects? Um, I'm not sure where you're writing from this question, but I think this is the um, question that almost everybody everywhere in the world has. How do we fund restoration? I think that we're seeing increased investment in restoration because of the targets and initiatives like the Aichi targets and the bond challenge. Um, and we are working with, uh, I, I, one of the keynote speakers in South Africa actually will be focusing on innovative funding mechanisms for restoration. So let me give you some examples of the types of things that are happening around the world right now to fund restoration, although we need much more than that. Um, the Nature Conservancy, for example, is partnering um, in Cancun, Mexico with um, the government of, um, the state that Cancun is in, I'm forgetting the name right now. I know it ends with OO, but I can't remember the whole name. Um, with the government of that state and with the hotel and convention association there to implement a new insurance initiative where if there is a storm where the winds reach a certain 
velocity, there will automatically be a payout to restore the coral reefs adjacent to um, off of Cancun because those coral reefs are one of the reason that tourists come to Cancun. The tourist industry is so important to um, the economy of Cancun. So they've actually developed um, what they call a parametric insurance policy that they don't need to prove there's been damage to the coral reef. If the wind re achieves a certain, reaches a certain velocity, they assume damage has occurred and they can start to implement restorative actions immediately and they have funding to do so. Um, this is a brand new approach to funding restoration that people have not used in the past. There are a lot of people looking at how we make that link, and I know the Eco Health Alliance is one of the um, partners on this um, this webinar series. We're, there's a lot of people looking at how do we make the link to um, environmental health and well-being for restoration. So I know there's been a project in um, Oregon and the United States, for example, where a local community has met with the hospitals and gotten the hospitals to invest in increasing green space in the community because it's going to reduce asthma rates. How do we make those same arguments for restoration? Another example is um, the Cape Town Water Fund. Again, the Nature Conservancy has been implementing water funds around the world looking at restoration for water security. So the new Cape Town Water Fund is funded by Coca-Cola and Pepsi and banks and others because Cape Town is out of water. And they've done an, a business case economic assessment that shows that doing ecological restoration in the watersheds that feed Cape Town is more economically um, viable, will deliver more water per dollar spent than any other action other than desalination plants. And it's equal, the investment in desalination plants and the investment in headwaters restoration is equal in terms of the deliverables. So those kinds of analyses, those types of economics cost benefit analyses will enable us to bring new partners into the restoration funding arena. We also see other entities that are looking at investing in restoration over the long term. Um, there's a lot of movement on this topic. We're gonna to be discussing it um, extensively in Cape Town. I know everybody can't come to Cape Town, but our keynote talks will be live streamed. So the keynote talk on funding mechanisms will be available publicly in September. That was a long answer, I'm sorry it took so long. Miguel, one more from you and then I'll go back to Kara. So the question is, how would you go about setting targets in poorly described ecosystems? I'm gonna say that um, I, my background is in political science and law, and I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. I know there are authors of the standards who could. Kara, I know everybody can't hear you. Do you want to give any answer to how to set targets in poorly described ecosystems since you're an author? Sure, that's a great question because unfortunately, so, the very yeah. short answer is that where you have incomplete information, you do the best you can to understand the condition the target area would have been in if it hadn't been degraded. Those can include successional models, historical information, uh, traditional knowledge, other sources of information you can get to do the best you can to put together. Okay. This is one of my favorite topics you could relay, and I would be happy to chat with someone by Skype or follow up by email. Excellent. Thank you all. So I'm not sure if Kara or Brock, maybe Brock, everybody can hear you, or Miguel, do you have any closing comments for the next one, letting people know what that is? And again, thanks to everybody for participating, for your great questions. Don't hesitate to send an email if you have questions or you want more information about anything I talked about today. And I'll turn it over to Brock or Miguel for closing comments. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, for the CEM folks, we're gonna have a regional update from South Asia, Asia region of the CEM in July. So please stay tuned for that. Um, and um, we welcome everybody from the the Nature Serve audience to sign up for our webinar series. It's open to all and everybody for the CEM series. Uh, please keep the Pulse of the Planet webinar series available and on your radar for future monthly sessions as well. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Have a great afternoon and happy solstice.